So, very Hello. good morning to all of you. Good morning. On, Hello. On, on behalf of uh, James Kalkaji, MD Sir, CAS, and PAG Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I welcome you all to this second day of the 16th International Conference on Business Sustainability in the Post Pandemic Era Resetting Strategies in Domains of People, Technology, and Environment. Technology is seen as the most radical driver of change from artificial intelligence and automation to digital mobility and virtual collaboration. The lines between our work and personal lives are shifting. Diversity and demands for equality are also reshaping the workplace. We are living longer, which means we'll be asked to master more and different skills over a period of time and as an assume that the nature of work changes. Apart from them, social environmental pressures are also creating demands for more flexible working conditions, as is the gig economy. These changes are both a source of anxiety and insecurity. So therefore, we understand that organizations today will need to rebalance their workforce to focus more on collaboration between technology and humans and to harness digital skills. So how do organizations prepare for all this tomorrow, today? To deliberate on this topic, we have eminent speakers amongst us to bring forward the pertinent issues and confronting the planning for workforce in the current times. With this, I would like to invite our distinguished guest today, Dr. Fadi Fadel, Dean and CAO, American Business School, Paris, France, for a special address. And I take this privilege of introducing him to the audience. Dr. Fadel joined the American Business School of Paris and he's currently the Dean. He's worked with his team on the national and international development of the program of the school. And his expertise in, is in the fields of politics and religion, women rights, interculturality, and many more. He's the author of the book, La Politique Afrian de Barack Obama. Dr. Fadel is also an adjunct professor at Middlebury College, Vermont, and a lecturer at Sherbrooke University in Canada, and a senior fellow at the UQAM. I invite Sir for the address. Thank you a lot, Irene. I appreciate uh, this moment that I share with you guys. I'm very happy to meet again uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Fadel. Uh, I would like first to express my gratitude to, to both, Dr. Gupta, Mr. Chairman, who is a friend as well, because I appreciate his personality, his profile, his leadership. And my thankfulness, Dr. Seth, because I met him one time and really appreciate his uh, professionalism and uh, his agility. And that's why, you know, I'm supposed to be yesterday with you guys, but yesterday I couldn't. So he adapted, he adjusted, and he said something appropriate to to be with you and to share, to share with you a few thoughts. So this morning, I'm sharing with you a few thoughts as educator. As uh, the lady said uh, <clears throat> before my intervention, it's true, the pandemic changed a lot in our way of thinking, in our, in our way of behaving, in our way of educating as well. So this big challenge, uh, we saw it at the American Business School of Paris as an opportunity, as an opportunity to earn more skills in connection with the way, the new way of learning and the new way of teaching. So please allow me to share with you a few, a few slides about how our community uh, has earned more skills in her attitude, in her way of uh, 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 overcoming this challenge. And at the end of the day, I don't think that even if we'll go back to the normal life again, uh, we will have to deal with the pandemic for the upcoming few years, at least for the social distancing measures. And at least, you know, through combining both the uh, online or the remote learning and the face-to-face -face learning. Is it okay? Can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes, it's visible, sir. Okay. Let me share with you how our faculty has adapted its attitude in order to be more in the, uh, in, in the mood of uh, interacting with the students. 
this, the faculty uh, has earned more soft skills with this, uh, within this context, more active listening and dialogue. We are not anymore in this mood where the professor arrives to the lesson and starts uh, lecturing because this one with the online learning doesn't work, but we are more in the interactive approach in the dialogue. And the students are not only people who are receiving the lessons, they are more stakeholders and they are partners in this new way of learning and new way of earning knowledge and earning skills. Flexibility and pedagogy is very important, you know, to the uh, faculty to, uh, to be humble. This pandemic, uh, we learned a lot to be humble because we had to adapt, we had to create new things and it's very important to not be afraid to back to a beginner state of mind. None of us uh, knew anything about Zoom before or about Teams, or if we knew, we knew very few things, but we accepted to go back to the beginner's state of mind to learn, to uh, adapt our way and to uh, use the new tools. And this humility, this modesty is very important in our life. And I think the skills is not only for now, it will accompany us, you know, throughout the upcoming month and the upcoming years. And with, the, uh, with this pandemic situation, the faculty has considered all forms of, of assessment, not only the midterm exam or the final exam, every single engagement and commitment from the students uh, has been and is a criteria that the students are earning the knowledge and they are interacting positively. And this has been noted by the faculty. Other point about the faculty attitude, they are providing more engagement activities and getting feedback to the students on their progress. And this is very motivating to the students, not only uh, giving lessons and that's it, but having more the return of the students to make sure that they are uh, uh, understanding and they are assuming what the lessons is supposed to be. They design their teaching materials and their assessment tasks uh, when tweaking and changing assessment from face-to-face -to, -face to remote learning. And this is very important. It's not the class which was supposed to be face-to-face. -face. We will just give it remotely, but we have to adjust. We have to put more uh, materials and more uh, assessment tasks to get the students really on track and really motivated. You know, one hour on the online teaching, it's the equivalent of at least three to four hours face to face. So that's why it's very important to have some engineering stuff, engineering uh, uh, commitment to the students to transform them into stakeholders and to put assessments to make sure that things it could be quizzes, it could be Q&A, etc. Technology. It's very important that they embed their learning within one platform for learning. We are used to have before sometimes uh, a, a platform with Google Doc, another one with uh, Become, another one, etc. With the uh, platform of Teams that we have adapted, we have put everything in, on Teams, and this was very helpful because the students have to deal only with one platform, and this was very helpful for them. And it's very important to be very consistent with the use of the vocabulary, because in the online, we have many ways, you know, of teaching online. We have the live streaming, we have the remote learning, we have the online learning. So every uh, term has its, I would say, implication and has its uh, own way of learning. So it's very important to have some consistency. And this is why our faculty, they adopted kind of uh, a glossary to make sure that the students are really uh, aware, aware about uh, the way that this, the faculty are teaching. Now, what about the students? And this is something very important because they are the center of our attention and the center of our uh, efforts. The students have to deal with the time management. You know, we are a school that we have 80%, 80%, 80% of our students that are internationals. They are coming from everywhere, more than 80 nationalities. So we have Americans, we have Indians, we have French, we have Germans, we have Middle Easterns, we have Japanese, Chinese, etc., etc. So when the pandemic uh, 
when the pandemic took place, most of the students, they went back home. So they have, when we have the live stream, they have to adapt and to manage their time, to manage the deadline, because they had to deliver presentations, deliver homework, uh, assignments, and to be interactive with their, within their team's work. So they had to really manage their time zone. Having flexibility, because the same learning outcomes, they are still set, but they are delivered differently. That's why they have to be flexible. And this flexibility is a very important soft skills because the recruiters nowadays, the industry is really highlighting this high quality agility besides the flexibility in terms of being tech savvy and able to change source of learning. And this is very important, not only to be stuck on one platform, but having this agility to, uh, to switch. Communication skills, this is another soft skill. And they are working in groups. You know, in the American system, all the classes, we have groups and the students are working in two or three or four people in each group. And you have many nationalities in each group. And this is very important. So they have to be interactive. They have to communicate with the other classmates to handle and to deliver the presentation that they have to prepare. Ability to ask for help. I know that in some cultures, uh, asking questions, interacting in classes, engaging in dialogue, it's not something very easy, but with the uh, remote learning, it's very important because if we miss something, it could be, you know, hectic for the, uh, 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 pursuing the, the lesson. Self-discipline, this is very important. Meeting the deadlines, managing residence process, you know, it's very important to have this autonomy, this maturity, independent motivation, Managing the working environment and regulation. When we are home, sometimes it's not easy, you know, with, with other uh, roommates to uh, managing the working environment. So this will create kind of uh, coordination with the other people. And very important, interacting with the intercultural team during the classes and the team's work. Another type of uh, 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 the uh, new earned skills from the students the professional development through, I will say that at the end of the day, our students are seeking for a job after graduating. Did you get me when I said that? Yes, yes. Till then we were, we were at the last of the skill sets. So we have adapted, we have adapted with the industry, all the activities allowing our students to be ready to market and to get their internship and to earn profession. So I guess, uh... Uh, due to this network uh, issues, I'll, we'll be moving on to, to the, uh, the first technical session for the day, and uh, which is going to be about building businesses of tomorrow, people, strategies in the forefront. So here, I would now like to welcome the chairperson of the session, Mr. Ron McLucky, chairman and CEO at World Institute for Action Learning India. Ron's role has been primarily to promote action learning and grow the World Institute for Action Learning throughout India. He leads major action learning client assignments and coach certification programs. His current focus is on helping clients improve business performance through dramatically better leadership, problem solving, and profound learning. Uh, the other panelists uh, for the session today we have, I would like to welcome Mr. Inya Sinrik, Director of Business Development DMH Business Advisors Private Limited. Another distinguished member for the session is, and I would like to welcome is Dr. Samantha Ratnayake, who is a faculty and management consultant at Postgraduate Institute of Management, University of Jayawardene Pura, Sri Lanka. Uh, yet another distinguished faculty that we, uh, uh, panelists that we have today and an extend a warm welcome is Dr. Spinder Dhaliwal, Director, Entrepreneurship Program, University of Westminster, London, UK. Unfortunately, one of our panel members, Ms. Brigitte Buchrich, uh, Director, Swiss Kalkrich, has not been able to join us today due to certain unavoidable circumstances. She's going to be deeply missed by, uh, her presence is going to be missed by all of us here today. So I would now like to invite uh, the chairperson, Mr. Ron McLucky, to initiate the discussion on the session team today. Well, good morning, everybody, and to uh, Dr. Seth and to Jim's, you know, thank you for the invitation of again uh, joining you, and you know, to the uh, the other panel members. I think I can see uh, uh, Dr. Spinder there. Uh, 
um, Dr. Samanta and uh, my good friend Ignace, who I've had the pleasure of working with before. You know, thank you so much for uh, for joining the panel. It's wonderful to have people of your caliber uh, along with us. Uh, what I will be doing is just providing some context uh, for this session and uh, just sharing my views very briefly on really human resource strategy. Yeah, you know, when I originally prepared this address, um, I uh, was sort of thinking about your know, HR strategy post COVID. And I think with the Indian situation at the moment, unfortunately, it's HR strategy in the midst of um, in the midst of COVID. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll take maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then I'm going to um, hand over to my uh, fellow panelists. So what I'd like to do is just provide a little bit of context um, to start with. I mean, as we all know, uh, COVID, I mean, it's just had unbelievable impact on the business world. Um, I mean, globally. Yeah, if there is a benefit of COVID, um, yeah, that has probably been the very rapid adoption you know, of communications technology you know, that we're using now that's been adapted and utilized all over the world. So, you know, I think that's, um, you know, that's, I guess, one positive outcome. And uh, I'm very fortunate and very blessed uh, to be, you know, speaking to everyone from uh, the top of the South Island in New Zealand. Uh, I run my India business now virtually uh, from New Zealand. So that's, <laughs> that's great. So, yeah, if we think about uh, COVID and, yeah, the first and obvious uh, impact is just the, yeah, everything's gone virtual. I mean, nobody in God's earth thought, yeah, that business throughout the world would be running virtually so rapidly and so quickly. And this has had, you know, major, major impacts uh, you know, that I think we are seeing, and I'd like to pick up on a few of them, because I think, you know, for human resource strategy, uh, these have, you know, really major, major impact. And, you know, the first impact that I think we've seen um, is undoubtedly on mental health and physical health, um, you know, of people. With working virtually from home, um, you yeah, I have the, uh, uh, the good fortune of uh, working very closely with a major Indian organization that employs um, yeah, largely uh, Indian women. And yeah, the stress that's been put on these people, you're yeah, running a full-time full job, um, a full-time family, you yeah, conflicting priorities with in-laws, with family. Um, yeah, it has just been absolutely um, I think horrendous for them. You know, and yes, there's yeah, what we saw at the beginning was yeah, initially a very positive response that wow, it's great, we don't have to spend three days, yeah, three hours traveling. Uh, and that was a blessing. You know, however, now I think the uh, the COVID fatigue yeah has set in. And if you look at the, and I'm not going to quote all the research, you know, the research that's been done globally, um, that uh, I think the estimates are something like 60 to 70 percent of the workforce is now being very negatively um, yeah, affected with yeah, all sorts of different mental health um, challenges. And along with, you know, I guess, the mental health stress, the challenges, um, a lot of people, physical health has been impacted enormously. Uh, in one client that I work with, um, you know, I had the pleasure of coaching, I think it's about 15 of their top executives. And before COVID, these people were really fit and healthy. Uh, in the last coaching session I did a month ago, um, six of those uh, 15 people have developed very serious uh, medical conditions in terms of high blood, blood pressure. Some are now pre-diabetic and some are actually diabetic. So, you know, what does this mean for the um, for HR strategy in companies? Yeah, firstly, I think it would be criminal if organizations do not very rapidly execute 
um, you have very robust um, you have physical health checkups um, for their people. These are not that difficult to do, and they're also relatively um, they're relatively inexpensive. Yeah, at this time when there's so much pressure on business and organisations, yeah, we just cannot afford to have our people, you know, so negatively impacted through um, through ill health and uh, and and mental stress. The other thing, from a strategy perspective, that I believe organisations should be doing, uh, and you know, in New Zealand, uh, yeah, this is just a, a norm of of how organisations work. Uh, is to have some sort of counselling service available, you know, to help people that are going through the, you know, the tremendous mental stress uh, that COVID has impacted on people. Uh, so I guess that's the first one. Yeah, you know, the, the, the second uh, impact that I personally observed and also that's been acknowledged in research is a significantly deteriorating relationship, you know, between managers and staff. You know, previously that informal contact, the discussion over a cup of coffee, uh, you know, the informal uh, chat when we get to work, you know, all of that is gone. And those relationships are deteriorating quite rapidly and also impacting things, um, uh, you know, like uh, staff turnover at, at all levels as well. So from a strategy perspective, you know, what can we do to prevent that breakdown of, you know, of manager and subordinate or staff relationships. What I experienced, again, research has indicated, probably the most powerful thing we can do uh, is have decent uh, individual coaching. And we can do that very easily online. The second thing is you know, what I refer to as just informal touch base sessions, you know, maybe just catch up sessions, maybe it's five minutes, 10 minutes in a week or whatever, just to catch up with people to you know, find out how they're going, what's happening. So that informal non-work related communication is critical. The third impact that, you know, I think we've, we've seen happening undoubtedly is a very rapidly decreasing sense of connection with company and with colleagues. You know, again, all that informal contact connection um, you know, that we had with people you know, um, around the coffee machine, over lunch, um, you know, over tea times, etc. cetera, um, you know, that's gone. The sense of connection with the company in terms of you know, looking at notice boards, um, you know, chatting with other people to find out what's going on, that's all gone. So strategically, you know, what do we need to do to, to address that? I think what I've seen a lot of clients doing now is to have the virtual town hall meetings to you know, communicate what's happening in the organization, using a lot of technology now to get people to communicate how they're feeling, what's happening with them, um, with the organization. And, you know, and also just the very deliberate communication briefs that go out to say what's happening in the company and so on. The, I guess, organizations all over the world before COVID had a huge problem, a massive problem um, with employee engagement. And COVID has impacted this uh, yeah, very seriously. And what we're seeing now is that employee engagement, and yeah, what I mean by engagement is that people, are, you know, if they have any discretionary time, they invest that in the good of the company and um, you know, to advance performance. That that engagement, again, is suffering very, very badly. So that employee engagement has been aggravated enormously um, you know, through COVID. So again, what do we, you know, what what strategies can we put in place uh, to address that? What quite a few organisations are doing, and this might sound cheesy, but it actually works. Um, you are know, starting clubs um, in a couple of the companies that I, I consult with. Yeah, you know, they st they started a cooking club where people can, you know, share their favourite curry recipes. They started photo photographic clubs, they've started book clubs, they've started um, you know, all sorts of um, 
clubs. Yeah, the other challenge uh, that it impacts that employee engagement is a lot of the informal uh, sort of work contact um, interaction is now gone. Yeah, people uh, typically have quite a lot of fun at work through social interaction, through joking around um, and so on. That's gone. So, you know, deliberately initiating some sort of non-work-related fun activities, virtual activities in the workplace, again, you know, is proving to be very, very powerful. Yeah, you know, stemming directly from that lack of engagement, uh, what we are also seeing is quite a rapid deterioration in collaboration and teamwork. Again, because you know, all the, the, the normal, formal and informal face-to-face -face, uh, interaction and contact um, is basically gone. And with that goes you know, quite a lot of the camaraderie, again, the fun, um, you know, just the joy of being part of a, a team that you meet with regularly is gone. So you know, strategically, what can we do about that? Um, you know, with one client that I'm uh, working with at the moment, um, what we've done is we've introduced project teams you know, to achieve major objectives. So instead of you know, having one senior manager, one department accountable for achieving certain major objectives, um, we've put in place multidisciplinary project teams you have to work together on, uh, you know, on delivering impo important projects and important results. And that has had um, you know, very, very positive impact uh, in what we're doing. The other area that I, yeah, is really exciting to see the development happening in uh, is in deliberate you know, virtual team development. You know, team development has been around for a long time in organizations in various shapes and forms. But what we see now is the, um, the very exciting evolution of a lot of face-to-face -face team building now in a virtual, uh, in a virtual world. Yeah, and I think that is happening um, yeah, more and more successfully. Yeah, two other areas that I can mention just briefly. Yeah, one is the huge challenge that learning and development now faces. Um, yeah, when you're listening to Dr. Fatty in terms of you know, the new skills that people will, uh, will need. Uh, what we are now having to do with a lot of clients is you know, help people with um, you know, a lot of self-management um, tools, a lot of collaboration tools. Um, you know, the whole communication, listening, interacting, building rapport. Quite often, it's not easy face to face. It's even more difficult in a virtual world. So, you know, it's a whole range of new skills. And then obviously, you know, a, a new range of development methodologies, you know, through e-learning, through, you know, the various channels of virtual learning. And again, uh, you know, I think the learning and development world is coming up with some, uh, some exciting stuff. And finally, Another major problem, and um, one of my family members uh, is the, my nephew is actually Vice President of Research and Development uh, at VMware Corporate in the US. And yeah, they, uh, they bring in on yeah, fairly regularly batches of 50 to 100 new graduates. And how do you on board, you know, new people into the organization, virtually. So again, you know, strategically, we look, we need to find new ways of introducing people to organizations, of communicating our values, our culture, um, you know, how we work with clients and all those things. And you know, getting that connection with people, making them you know, embrace the corporate culture, embrace our vision, embrace our direction. And doing that, um, and doing that virtually. So those are just some of the you know, strategic issues that I believe human resources people and corporate executives, managing directors, etc., you know, will have to face, um, yeah, in the in the very near future.
So, um, ladies and gentlemen, what I have done is I've allocated some time at the end of the session, you know, to deal with sort of Q and A uh, with the other presenters. You know, if there are any quick questions you'd like to ask them, that's fine. And we have dedicated about 15, 20 minutes at the end of the session. So now it is my great pleasure to um, to introduce um, Ignace uh, Hendrik. Uh, Sanjila, our, our gym's host, has uh, very kindly and courteously done, Thank you. Uh, done me the favor of introducing him. So I'm not going to go over all of that again. Um, so Ignace will be talking on leadership post COVID, people first. So Ignace, thank you very much for joining us and uh, over to you, mate. Thank you, Ron. Um, wonderful to meet all of you. Um, thank you, Ron, for setting the tone uh, for this session. You had a beautiful background. This was like the perfect place to work from home. It's like you are in a holiday setting. First, let me share the presentation. Is it visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay. So good morning. It's a big difference compared to the normal sessions where we are in um, PhD chamber in Delhi. And we can always see so many young and vibrant students in front of us. Today, we see a lot of pictures and I'm happy that almost 200 people are joining. The topic is new strategies after COVID. And I will talk about people. Why are people important? About a year ago, COVID-19 changed everything overnight. A lockdown was enforced and social distancing and masks became the norm. The pandemic impacted the way we live, shop, study, travel, and work. Business dynamics have been really disrupted in a way we have never seen before in our modern human history. Companies had a very hard time to recover. They were, they were forced to reinvent themselves and take fast and bold moves. Even today, there are no easy answers. You won't find them by looking backward, but only by looking at tomorrow and hoping you are doing the right thing. Due to government restrictions, companies around the world have been asking their people to work from home. A lot has been written about financial benefits of remote working or working from home. But there is always, or there is also a very alarming side effect of working from home. Something you really need to know. Just hang on. Let's start with the two key benefits of remote working for employers and employees. These benefits are valid for most of the countries around the world. Let's start with the employees. What is the number one key benefit of working from home? It's about commuting, commuting time and travel expenses. Imagine, you live in Greater Noida and your office is in Cyber City, Gurgaon. It takes you two hours in the morning to reach the office. It's a nightmare. It's a pain. It's stressful, especially when you drive yourself. Just calculate four hours commuting a day, two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, four hours commuting a day, is 20 hours a week when you work from Monday to Friday. That's an average of 80 hours a month or 960 hours a year. 960 hours means 120 working days. What a loss of productivity. On the other hand, when you work from home, you save a lot of time but also fuel expenses, maintenance costs of your car, parking fees, and so on. You save easily a few thousand rupees a month. And families with two cars can consider to go to one car. It's a huge saving. 
Professor Nicholas Bloom from Stanford University in America estimates that working from home lowers commuting time amongst Americans by more than 60 million hours per workday. 60 million hours per workday. What a number. Commuting by car takes away around 15% of the annual income of employees in the West. This was the first key benefit for employees, saving travel costs, saving travel time. The second benefit, it's about cost of living. There is, when you work from home, there is no need to live close to the office in the city center. You can move to less costly regions. The cost of living and rentals are really high in big cities. One example, the rent of a 300 square feet furnished apartment in the center of Paris cost anything between 1,500 and 2,000 euros a month. 2,000 euros a month is a monthly rent of 170,000. It's a massive spending. Wi-Fi and work from home policies allow us to work and live in more cheaper areas. Students, this is Natalia's workplace. She's from New York and moved to India. During the pandemic, she and her husband moved to this place. Do you know what it is? It's in your very own India, in Palampur, in Himachal Pradesh. Last December, I visited her at her cottage in Palampur together with her husband, and they enjoy every minute working from home. Wi-Fi and cloud computing are big enablers for them. Second benefit, when you work from home, there is no need to live close to the office and pay expensive rents or pay expensive mortgages. These are the two key benefits for employees. But one important remark, when discussing financial aspects of remote working, you need to remember that not everything can be measured. You need to look beyond the numbers. We do that in a short while. But now we talk about the key benefits of remote working for companies, for employers. The first benefit is about office space. So my this picture, this is Cyber City in Gurgaon. Companies, especially those located in main business districts, pay huge amounts for office and parking rent, electricity, water, and security. In most American cities, the yearly office rent comes to fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars per employee. Just calculate the saving when companies don't have to pay rent for let's say 50, 100 or 500 people, when you know that the average rent or cost for the building is $15,000 per person. When people work from home, that's a big saving for the company. A second saving for the company, as we discussed, commuting to the office creates a lot of stress. Less or no commuting leads to less stress and less stress leads to an increased employee productivity and better performance. Less stress also leads to happier employees and happier employees lead to an improved employee retention. An improved employee retention leads to less recruitment costs. In India, a recruiter normally takes 8.3% of the cost to the company. Imagine if we can save this by hiring less people and keep the people. So we need to make them happy. If we have less stress, less commuting, happier people will stay. That's the second saving. First saving was office rent. Second saving was we save on the recruitment cost. But again, we need to remember ladies and gentlemen, students that not everything 
can be measured. We need to look beyond the numbers. Companies are so focused on cash flow, cutting costs, revenue and bottom line, parameters which are really important and forget the number one thing that really matters. The number one thing that really matters in a company are your people. They should come first. Why are people important? Values like cooperation, corporate culture, knowledge sharing, innovation are considered fundamental to the success of companies. These values depend on working close together in the office. These values are coming under pressure because of working from home. Simply saying that you care about people is not enough. You need to show them, you need to take action. If people are important, you need to trust them. Work from home requires a change in management style from visible management, seeing what the employees are doing to trust management and coaching. And coaching. It's not about how many hours your people work on the laptop. It's not about being busy. Even ants are busy the whole day, but it's about the in about to result, the outcome. It's about what you have done. It's about the output that's more important. So if you really say that people are important, you need to trust them. Second thing, if you consider people important, you need to know the issues. It's not going well with people. Like Ron said, meeting in the office, informal meetings, time spent with colleagues at lunchtime around the coffee machine are really important. All that we are missing, no informal meetings, no guidance from the manager, no lively group discussions, no energy of meeting together at the office. People are not doing well. It starts to affect, impact the social or emotional well being of our employees. And especially now, here in India also, when cases are going up every day, we are getting stressed and depressed, and the feeling of isolation is growing. In my country, Belgium, depression and burnout are on the rise. And yes, we crave for social contact, that's how our brains are wired. So as a manager, you need to set up informal meetings, Zoom calls, video calls, or a normal phone call to inquire about the well-being of your, of your people. You need to guide them, you need to know their issues. So as a future manager, you have the opportunity. Now, I would rather say the obligation to help your people we need to help them setting boundaries. When do you expect your, te your team to be available? When do you expect them to be online and offline? We need to be very clear. Work time, it's time to work. Off time or relax time, it's time to relax. Just one example, my friend Rajiv Bella, MD of the Belgian company Barco here in India, say that technology was a big enabler for him during COVID but he makes it a point to keep the phone away when he's busy with family. And that's very important. You need family time. You need time for yourself. No blurring between office and, and, and personal time. You cannot be 24 hours available for the company. So you need to coach your people during these difficult times. You need to share information. You need to be proactive. You ask them, about their well being. You try to guide them, you talk to them, at least have a weekly call to ask about their well being. It's important that you connect with your people, but also the people need to connect with each other. You need to have these virtual meetings where we can talk non business issues. Again, we crave for social contact. We want to be connected and feel connected with our team. 
we need to avoid as a manager a team out. So we need to have all the people in the team. They need to be connected and feel connected. And of course, as a manager, you need to be available for your team. You need to be there whenever they want to call you. You need to listen to the personal problems also. You need to show your caring. That's very important. Of course, there are a lot of issues. We don't know how COVID will evolve, but I think in future, we will have a system of hybrid working. Working at the office with the freedom to work two or three days at home, that's very important. To conclude this talk, you need to remember that not everything can be measured. You need to look beyond the numbers. People are important, people first. You need to show it, you need to take action. You need to trust your people, you need to know their issues, and you need to guide them through these difficult times. It's not an easy task, but in my opinion, it's the only way to overcome today's challenges. And I trust that you as future managers will do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ignace. Yeah, I try um, to stop sharing. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ignace. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to um, yeah, just note down questions and comments that you'd like to make, and we will make um, uh, yeah, some time available at the end of the presentations to discuss this in more detail. And yeah, thank you, Ignace. I think yeah, this certainly brings over the, I guess, the gravity of the situation that a lot of people are working under at the moment. I think we truly, we truly don't, in many cases, appreciate and respect that. And, you know, that's probably the, the single thing that we can do as leaders uh, is actually walk the talk uh, that, you know, the people are important, not just the, the rhetoric. So thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Ignis. Now it's my huge pleasure to uh, bring a, a completely different perspective, a UK perspective, um, no doubt a, another global perspective to uh, introduce um, Dr. Spinder uh, Daliwal, uh, Director of Entrepreneurship Program, University of Westminster, London. And again, um, yeah, thank you, Sajila, for introducing our lovely guest speaker. So Dr. Spinder, thank you so much for joining us and we really look forward to your uh, presentation. Over to you. Okay, good morning, everybody. I mean, it's very, very early here in the UK. So, um... I am delighted to be part of this conference and I'd like to thank Dr. Seth and his team for inviting me. I always enjoy my trips to India and I'm gutted that this year I cannot come physically. Um, I'd like to um, obviously offer my thoughts and prayers to India at this very difficult time. I think the whole world is going through something very difficult and the previous speakers have uh, mentioned some of the challenges there. I'm hoping that young entrepreneurs will be the future of our society and somehow we will get out of this mess, um, you know, as soon as we can. So without more ado, can you see me when I change the slides? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, so, so okay. So really, um, Young entrepreneurs with their energy and their drive and confidence and resilience really are the perfect formula for entrepreneurial success. The world is going to need around half a billion jobs by 2030 and companies cannot provide these jobs and so encouraging entrepreneurship for the young has to be the key and that came from a joint report by the Global Enterprise Monitor and um, business, Youth Business International. They also found that young people up to the age of 35 are the most likely to start a business. And so therefore we need efforts to support them and encourage them. So it's not just an aspiration, it is really a necessity. So um, the advantages of youth are many. The technology era has opened many, many doors and it's, it's enabled 
people to start up businesses very cheaply and very quickly. But what we need is sustainable businesses that could go forward. And um, some of these ones have um, really got had enormous growth. Younger people also have greater energy and motivation. You know, you've got the whole world in front of you and you have less to lose. You're unlikely to have a mortgage. So sometimes you don't always have a family that you're the main breadwinner for. So there's lots, there's less to lose and any bit of experience is good for your CV. So trying anything new is, is really excellent. Um, however, you tend to have less money, less savings and less experience. And maybe you're aware, less aware of your own strengths and weaknesses because of this lack of experience. So, but the advantage of, is of youth, um, is that one of the um, students that I interviewed said, I had no fear, no mortgage, no major responsibilities. Um, you know, you have more room to make mistakes. Even if you fail, it looks great on your CV and you grow in experience and maturity. So it's character building. And as you know, most entrepreneurs who are successful have failed many, many times. Failure is not a problem. Um, so what kind of drivers are there? There are many risks facing young entrepreneurs. And um, really, you have to work very, very hard. There's no way of getting out of that. There is no get rich scheme out there. You have to work hard. And really, because you can't afford to employ people, you're multitasking, you're trying to do everything. Like many small business owners, you're trying to do everything. You're multitasking as a manager, salesperson, negotiator, etc. So, um, but the big benefit for young entrepreneurs today is that they're lucky they grew up with new technologies and social media. So this will benefit them enormously as it's second nature to them to, to be on the web and to, to be online. And so during this whole COVID era, you know, they're, they're very tech savvy. So what um, support is there? Universities around the world, if we look at entrepreneurship education, it's really evolved. Universities around the world are recognizing the importance of entrepreneurship as the future of management education. Nearly virtually every university offers some kind of entrepreneurship program. They have um, extracurricular activities such as, um, you know, sort of startup business shops, etc. They add value to the actual curriculum by having entrepreneurial societies, entrepreneurs in residence, summer intensive courses, boot camps. So there's lots of lots happening in the world with entrepreneurship education. The governments as well, all through the world, they are supporting initiatives and they need to do more. I mean, universities clearly are the perfect breeding ground for young entrepreneurs. It's where you meet, you develop ideas and you can um, sort of rehearse your ideas. Government support is, is essential. And if young entrepreneurs are going to be the job and wealth creators of the future, they really need some grounding and some help. And, you know, we need to let them make their vision a reality and really help that happen. And so, you know, it's one thing injecting self-belief and dynamism, but how do these dreams get into reality? How do they go forward? And there's a myriad of sources available in most um, countries in the world. The UK government, for example, have several initiatives that help young people to set up their own business. They have Startup Loans UK, loans mentoring schemes, and um, we have organizations such as the Prince's Trust where Prince Charles set up the Prince's Trust where they help young entrepreneurs. And these are mainly from very disadvantaged families and they give them very small bits of money. So, so they're not big grants or funding, small bits of money just to get them going and just to stop them struggling from, from an early stage. There are lots of programs and accelerators to are gaining momentum and accelerators provide um, chosen graduates, they tend to be se selected or self-selected. Um, they provide them with money, time and space, they provide networks, they provide mentors as well. And there are some very high tech, high successful business cases coming from accelerators. One example is the Entrepreneur First Accelerator Programme, which is a novel model where top technology graduates are helped to build startups together 
They take people at the very, very early stages before they even have a team or even a startup idea. So they're investing in the person and giving them that, that, that um, support. They give them three months of unconditional support, such as funding to survive, mentorship and other, other support. And then they get to the next stage where they help them build teams and then develop ideas together. So that the first cohort um, are worth around 100 million pounds in total today. So very successful. Mentors, I think you're all aware, are very powerful. To have a good mentor is invaluable. And um, many entrepreneurs stay in touch with their mentors beyond any structured program. And there's always issues around matching entrepreneurs to the right mentor and these um, dedicated programs are getting better and better at that. It's also good for someone to be a mentor because they give back to the community, they give back to somebody younger and allow them to really learn from their own mistakes and their own journey. Access to funding is also a, also a big, big area for anybody going into business and particularly young people who are likely to have fewer savings. They tend to rely on the bank of mum and dad in the first place. They tend to do sort of bootstring, um, shoestring and really try and lower the amount of money they need to borrow. So a lot of bootstrapping going on there. And, um, you know, crowdfunding, lots of other try ways of trying to get funding, but it's always an issue unless you get some kind of government support. And I mentioned how important social media and technology are in today's era. You know, they play an enormous and increasingly important role in business for everybody, but particularly for young people where it tends to be pivotal to their business. So many sites now are household names. So you talk about Pinterest, Facebook, Google+, Reddit, LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat. They're all interactive They're with you at the center, you being the big part of the story. And so with all their discussion boards, groups, likes, dislikes, etc., that you know you can now connect to your customers, suppliers, financiers more closely and really get to know them. And that enables you as a business to rapidly respond to their needs, demands, complaints, and praise. And you know, young people are well set up for that. So what I did for this study was um I had I interviewed 12 young people, 12 young entrepreneurs sort of budding and, you know, who'd been in business for a few years. Some of them, they were all under 35 years of age. They were UK based. Some were traditional, some were trad technological businesses or virtual. And these were face to face, semi structured interviews, which I filmed to get more depth, detail and accuracy. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of these. Um, rather than go through all of them, just to give you a flavour of, of what's out there. So this girl, Georgie Bullen, she started her business at the age of 18. She's got a fantastic um, background. She was visually impaired from a young age and therefore always struggled with her academic work and um, had to find a different ways to really unleash her talents. And she became a Paralympian, which is, which is such a great honour for the UK goalball team. Now goalball is, is a ball with bells inside so people who are visually impaired can see it and it's a team sport, highly competitive, highly aggressive. So there's two teams and then you have to get the ball in the net but you can only throw it with your hands, you can't kick it. And um, when she, she became a Paralympian, one of the youngest players in the UK and reached the quarterfinals in the Paralympics in 2012, but she used her victory to launch her own business. And what she's doing is using it to team build for corporates. And they come to her and they have these team building exercises and the business has really grown. She's been very um, pivotal to the success of the business in terms of knowing that she is the unique selling point. Her, her background as a sportswoman is what's, what's really taking her forward. And she goes around the country giving speeches and really being very confident there. Another, I'm just touching on these and the, the, I'll, I'll guide you as to if you want there's further story. Um, the other um, student I interviewed was um, Solvega Pakstrata, who's Lithuanian. She was doing an undergraduate project and she was really wondering what, how to, what to do for her project. And um, 
being innovative, um, she uh, she won the James Dyson Award for her her initiative, which is Bump Mark. Now, Bump Mark came in a weird way. She was um, were doing some work for, for her university, and she was interviewing elderly people and people who were struggling. And once again, actually, funnily enough, it's, it's about the visually impaired, but um, she, she did interview a group of blind people and she said, how can you tell if you put milk in your tea, you know, how much to put in? And they had measurements for that. She said, how can you tell if it's not right, you know, if, it, if it's gone bad? And then it got her mind working on a project that a lot of food has gone bad. And if you are blind, how can you tell that it has? And then um, and she wanted to really have something innovative to, to give to the, to the sector. And um, it was the humble banana that came to her rescue because she saw a banana in a bowl of fruit and she saw the black marks on the banana and the bumps. And she thought, my goodness, but you know, um, blind people could actually feel that. And if she could replicate that and have that uh, as part of um, her project that would really help and so obviously in her university using all the resources she came up with Bump Mark which now has been taken forward as, as a company and is doing really well and you know you can feel it, it's specialist for, for blind people where they can feel if food has gone off. In, in terms of the packaging. So it's so a very resilient, very innovative. She stayed alert to opportunities. She won awards to get money for her project and, um, you know, really, really did well. Um, a different type of business is um, this one by Christian Els, who was actually a student at my university. Um, he founded hallbookers.co.uk, which he started very young um, at the age of 21. Now he was an overseas student from Australia, so I think near you, Ron, and um, he came to the UK. And when he came to the UK, he was put in a hall of residence with other students. However, he was so disappointed with his accommodation when he had received the brochures and he looked on the website, he had, re, you know, all the pictures were glossy of a lovely room and all the facilities. When he actually arrived in London and was given his um, private accommodation, it was awful. You know, poor water, running water, really poor quality room. And he found it very difficult to concentrate on his studies. And he realised that this was a problem for a lot of overseas students where they felt cheated and really didn't have the right information because they're trying to book a room from a country very, very far away. And so when they finally arrive, it is very different from what they, what they expected. So therefore he founded hallbookers.com where you give real reviews and actually, you know, have, have a real sense. So it's students giving reviews and helping other students to, to actually really find their way. And, and that's really important. I'll end this on um, Amit Pate. I have to end on an Indian. So an Indian student who came to the UK, very, very innovative. He joined an accelerator program. And um, with that accelerator program, it was the entrepreneur first one where they are, you know, really developed as individuals, then they formed teams. So he formed a team with two other people and he was looking at facial recognition technology. And his first idea was as, a, as an undergraduate, he went to a lot of parties and he met a lot of people and, you know, they took pictures and this and that. And he said, you know, after a few weeks, you don't remember the names of the people you met. You've got the photos, you don't always know the names. So he was trying to come up with a technology where the photos you know, you could match the names and there would be some, some, some kind of technology around that. He had to pivot from that idea. And in fact, it was the um, gruesome terrorist attack at the Boston Marathon in the US that ended up being the backdrop backdrop to his innovative new idea where um, you know the police there were looking for um, anybody who had taken photos of, of this terrorist attack and they were trying to get them all together and he felt that if his technology had been there he would have found the facial recognition and helped them. 
So, um, you know, so he is developing cutting edge technologies with his Snaptivity app, but it's moved a stage further where now he's monetizing it and he's working in the UK with stadiums and trying to capture the emotions of people's facial expressions and then really using that as an advertising campaign for corporates who are, you know, and getting sponsorship deals from that. So a very innovative Indian student who came to the UK and did really, really well. So in conclusion, um, you know, I just touched on a few stories, really trying to encapsulate the spirit of the young and how they have resources available to them. They have personal resources, hard and soft um, support as well. But there is clearly a need to promote young entrepreneurs and to offer them structured support, finance and mentoring. Young people are more likely to employ other young people. And so they will help with the youth unemployment problem, which is going to be so pertinent and is pertinent and is worldwide. And um, more importantly, young people can experiment with business ideas. They could fail and it's all a learning process. And whether they become entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs or employees, it will make them better and more experienced. And on that positive note, I would hand it back to Ron. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Spinner, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. And um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I found that um, yeah, in the midst of all the COVID uh, doom <laughs> and gloom, um, you know, very positive and uh, inspirational. So thank you. The, a couple of points I really loved there because this resonates uh, very close to my heart. Yeah, is that failure is not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true oh. isn't it? i think we always um think failure is wrong but how do you learn if you don't fail yeah you yeah expensive lessons I, I learned that the hard way as well um uh, and you know from a, a capability development viewpoint i think a, a brilliant point that you brought up there oh. that you yeah, know from the sort of entrepreneurial adventure in terms of capability is brilliant from you know, what I think your words were with the multitasking. You know, you learn about technology, you learn about marketing, you learn about finance, you learn about bringing everything, um, sometimes very painfully and other times with, uh, with great benefit. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, a pleasure. I think uh, a lot to, for all of us to take away from that. Okay. Uh, time to move on so if uh, we could ask Angela just to close this presentation that would be wonderful so we could get some of these young entrepreneur techies to help us eh? <laughs> thank, you. Okay. thank you so That's much okay. <laughs> um, so it's now my pleasure uh, that was yeah, wonderful to get a, a UK perspective so now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Samantha uh, Ratnayaki from uh, Sri Lanka, and that's a postgraduate uh, Institute of Management. And uh, he will be talking on management insights for strategic foresight, resetting the strategic agenda. So Dr. Samantha, again, thank you so much for uh, joining us. It'd be great to get your know, further international perspectives uh, and my pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, so very good morning and my um, best wishes uh, go to Dr. Seth for your wonderful coordination. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Sharon, you have sent a wonderful mail also. Thank you very much for that coordination. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, well, um, so if we... Uh, uh, Dr. Ratnak, good morning. Dr. Seth here. How are you? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so namaste. Dr. And Ratnak, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, namaste. Um, namaste to you. Please continue. Please continue. Right. Um, well, uh, so the uh, the starting point for me uh, in this uh, the whole conference, uh, Dr. Seth, you have uh, set a wonderful topic uh, in this case called Management Insights for Strategic Foresight. Uh, in that, uh, based on your oral conference, uh, in fact, I have been working uh, with this uh, the main team and um, a, a couple of other settings also. I have shared a few thoughts. Uh, but in terms of uh, particularly uh, this technical session covers the people, technology aspects, uh, yeah, I will be bringing 
some people perspectives uh, in, at the latter part uh, in terms of uh, the strategic uh, some of the philosophical foresights i have thought uh, I, I like actually i have amended it uh, while this session is on uh, so in that sense i hope that it's not an inconvenience to uh, uh, anyone uh, having said that uh, uh, so i'm coming from uh, sri lanka so one of the largest universities called university of sri jayawardenepura so that has one of the postgraduate uh, institutes um, called postgraduate institute of management in sri lanka so this is one of the premier mba uh, so we are working at mba and uh, doctoral level we are operating in while in sri lanka and some other six seven countries uh, the in terms of uh, my engagement uh, where i would be uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the say thoughts uh, apart from my current engagement at national level uh, in, in line with the uh, uh, judging these entrepreneurs uh, uh, in the country because i'm i'm the chairman of that committee uh, at uh, one of the chambers uh, apart from that sme sector uh, development uh, committee i am uh, giving a major contribution there uh, in addition to that uh, this people development cluster i am heading uh, for last 6 7 years so i can share some of those thoughts at the latter stage uh, having said that uh, let me put it to a perspective of the context content and conduct so i what i mean the context in broadly the macro picture and few thoughts in terms of the content area in brief and getting into uh, the um, uh, practical uh, leading some uh, something in person is where we look at the conduct uh, in terms of uh, context uh, may i begin with uh, so i actually i have reduced a couple of uh, this uh, a deep philosophical sites so will will uh, look at if it is required at the uh, answer level uh, look um, uh, may i uh, start with uh, uh, one of the quotes from the late uh, ck prahalad professor um, the imagining the uh, future may be more important than analyzing the past so uh, let's see uh, what we are ex exactly going to look at in that light so let me connect that from that to peter drucker what he said the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence it is to act with yesterday's logic so if i reiterate to act with yesterday's logic so that's that is where uh, one of the challenges for us because uh, some of the problems uh, which we are now uh, uh, grappling with are not actually due to covid but the covid has uh, uh, enlarged or it has given a different meaning to some of the unresolved problems so we have new problems unresolved problems and some complex problems coming up but the point is that are we ready to look at uh, with a new logic so in that light uh, let's uh, look at this familiar term uh, this acronym vuca so i'm not going to explain that but i want to ask a question the question here i'm asking based on this research article in 2012 uh, that the two axes so if you look at how well can you predict the outcome of your actions so are we are we clearly working on that so at the same time how much do you know about the situation so what what is the kind of a striking balance so here while knowing that uh, in terms of uh, vuca i would uh, bring another acronym uh, here that is called actually tukar or t u c a r so this turbulence uh, uncertain uh, complex and ambiguity is there but the ro is the other area sometimes we tend to forget so that that's what uh, uh, the david beach argues in um, is from uk the ro ro stands for this risk and the opportunity so are we assessing that are we taking this risk into opportunities so this this the one thinking the other aspect is the vuca 2.0 uh, so as bill george uh, from harvard uh, argued that strategy for study leadership in uh, in an unsteady world where we have the knowledge base at the moment to look at vuca from 1.0 to 2.0 so this uh, it's not just a acronym play so if you look at that it's a matter of uh, volatile to make a new vision uncertain to get it to understanding complex to get more clarity ambiguous uh, ambiguous into more agility so are we doing that are we setting our uh, practices in those lines at the same time if you look at the two two slides i want to share uh, in terms of the vuca 2.0 many um, the 
developmental fronts have been uh, established, like uh, working with people, emotional intelligence, uh, in line with vision, understanding, clarity, agility. Uh, the same way, let me share the next slide also. Uh, that is called leadership skills for world about to dawn. Uh, in that line, the vision, understanding, compassion, and agility. So all these practices are there with us. The only the challenge is that are we really getting uh, some insights from those uh, contextual philosophical background to our content. So with that, uh, the content, so if I ask this question from um, this famous quote, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would use the first 55 minutes determining the proper questions to ask. So dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, are we asking those proper questions at this juncture? So are we considering this COVID-19 transition? Our uh, session chair has put a nice uh, uh, thoughts process into a perspective where uh, what, uh, what we are looking at in broader sense, uh, but in terms of giving solutions, we want to ask a question like, are we asking adequate number of questions at this juncture even? Uh, I, I will I'll line up um, later uh, in a while. So having said that, all we are looking for new insights. It's all about the capacity to gain an accurate and deep understanding of someone or something. So that, uh, do we have that insight? And in that light, may I get a quote from um, uh, Steve Jobs, what he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. Quite strange. You can only connect them looking backward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in, the in your future. So uh, the, in, in, in line with, uh, if you look at this uh, forward and backward, uh, are, we, are we in that, uh, uh, the mood now? Like, uh, are we learning from COVID transition? Are we really aligning our people, technology processes, institutional uh, capabilities uh, to new demands? Or are we looking backward of uh, what we are missing or what we are lacking? And, uh, so it's quite uh, interesting time for us to um, explore in a conference of this nature. So with that, may I say that among many theories, concepts, opinions, ideas, so how do we navigate? So for that, let me come to my third area. But at this point of time, uh, Mr. Chairman and the, uh, the other uh, the intellectuals, distinguished members, I want to ask your question. So uh, from a management point of view, like in line with our, the practices, we have a lot of, uh, so the inductions and deductions about our understanding uh, this, uh, the uh, phenomena. But uh, in a management point of view, uh, the most of our professional thoughts are to a great extent now uh, leading towards, uh, rather than induction and deduction, more abductions. So we are like uh, making some comments and views and opinion uh, at a um, exponential manner, which have no uh, substantial kind of a philosophical um, backing. So in that light, uh, may I say, uh, may I say it's high time for us to explore further, but at this time I will uh, exclude that part and would concentrate on the, uh, the people aspect and some other areas of that nature. So are we ready to practice? So in that light, uh, the uh, Henry Minsberg um, in his one of the quotes uh, clearly say, uh, the real challenge in crafting strategy lies in detecting subtle discontinuities that may undermine a business in the future. And for that, there is no technique, no program, just a sharp mind in touch with the situation. So that, uh, so shall we uh, collectively explore whether, whether we have that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, touch with the situation? And in that light, people factor is in the forefront. Uh, having said that, uh, here uh, the uh, uh, one question. Let's pause and uh, ask this question. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, dear friends, is it a failure in our preparedness for future versus uh, creating foresight for our, our institutional future. So as um, management uh, uh, professionals uh, and other uh, scholarly uh, en engaging uh, personnel, I want to ask that, so where is our preparedness? Where is our readiness? Where, where are those uh, practices 
within us. So I think uh, it's high time for us to look at that. Even a couple of days back, I was at another conference when I was addressing uh, one, one of the scholars presented a beautiful finding about uh, the new views about the, the, the participants where that's in educational context, uh, like majority wanted to go back, go back for their physical work and, uh, and giving, so um, the, the other speaker gave some fascinating uh, productivity, commuting and other benefits of people practices where the findings show, look, we want to go back. So is that what we are looking at for the future? So where is our foresight thinking? So that's um, in that light, may I touch upon a little bit on that um, in that sense. So the foresight means, uh, dear friends, it's about the systematic thinking and mapping of the future. So it's a futuristic thought process. So in that light, foresight comes from, uh, generally from assumptions and we are looking at the possibilities. So the, the bridging connector is the other foresight comes. So let me cut down these uh, theoretical aspects on that. So, but foresight comes uh, in a technical form called way of prognosis, our past practices, examining the trends, what trends happen in there. And of course, we need to be ready for planning scenarios. I think one of the need of the hours is that in this, um, at this juncture is that planning scenarios. Uh, this COVID has given ample uh, testing imperative for us. For an example, like uh, we thought COVID first, second, third, fourth, now multiple variants. The, um, so the new, new some findings uh, indicate that it's uh, air, airborne. So then what we are going to do, how we are going to plan our engagements. So in this um, virtual sessions, are, are they applicable to the, uh, the training uh, scope? Is it applicable for some other non-digital area where we need uh, the relationship. I think that's what uh, Mr. Ron has very clearly built up uh, opening remarks saying that networking versus relationship and engagements, how to strike a balance so that um, management foresight is to be uh, uh, like deployed heavily towards exploring these, uh, these aspects. So with that, so if you look at this uh, between future and today, uh, so, so some of the interesting thoughts there in terms of getting how the, how to getting into a foresight as a practice like sensing, sensing, and meshing. So that's a, that is where about shake up and the surface the blind spots. Uh, I'm I'm sure through these conferences uh, we would be able to get a lot of blind spots surface and to get into the new reality transformation. So that's all about foresight connection between future and today. So with that, uh, the, uh, I would like to add some other new practices in scenario planning, particularly in the foresight uh, domain. That's called strange making. Familiar to strange, strange to familiar. And from that, uh, develop your transition design. So what is the kind of a transition design? As educational professionals, what we want to do. As entrepreneurs, like what we want to do. What are the kind of messages we are going to create? What is the kind of people practices we are going to create? And now we used to say in uh, HR uh, language, uh, training is to do, development is to be. But in that light, so are we creating that? For that, um, the scenario planning uh, is a science of surprise. So the science of surprise is now coming to the forefront. So as professionals, so we need to get, um, more and more activities. Uh, the previous speaker shared some of the success stories of uh, uh, entrepreneurial um, incubation and transformations. And uh, so I think those are very much wonderful in this life. And how to get this uh, new sizing, uh, sensing, sizing, seizing kind of a science of surprise uh, scenarios. So with that, um, if you look at a bit of a technicalities of forecast, uh, it is about um, identifying the driving forces, uh, looking at these critical uncertainties, critical uncertainties and creating these scenarios and discuss action points. Ladies and gentlemen, scenario planning was not just what it has been discussing since 60s at a strategic uh, uh, mapping or strategic agenda setting discussions. It is now in the focal point. So it's our task to take it forward. So with that, um, what is our challenge in that sense? So we need to build a story. 
we need to build a story and we should be able to tell that in a concrete manner because most of our uh, the creating stories are very abstract and they are just abductions just thoughts just views just comments so predictions are getting like so the science and technology uh, the science and technology um, comments views and the ideas what we are telling to our staff our people are actually getting um, excluded and obsolete uh, overnight so then uh, uh, we are in a, we are in a very testing imperative ground because of the covid so with that uh, we'll we'll look at a little bit on this personal approach uh, to work uh, where this famous uh, uh, outside in thinking of uh, the manipulation versus inside out thinking the inspiration so uh, are we are we really taking this outside in view and giving out of our inside out thinking or rather without looking at the outside realities we just think that we can do we can go back uh, I, we have lost the previous scenarios uh, is that the case while appreciating the outside in perspectives can we create the inside out uh, impact to the uh, society or the whatever engagements we do uh, and um, with that uh, in my final thoughts just to refresh uh, where are the people challenges in um, world economic forum uh, if i share those um, just simple ones 2015 the complex problem solving 2020 list complex problem solving so if you look at 2022 list it's all about analyzing active learning creativity technology and critical problem solving uh, and uh, in terms of the 20 25 top 10 skills you can see here on my left the problem solving self management working with people technology so uh, getting problem solved while uh, looking at the individual development and the working with people uh, matters a lot and if you look at the the soft skill uh, skills uh, set also uh, in that light but i am not going to look at uh, much on but um, the most of the uh, hard skill areas are now are being compelled to apply by uh, the relevant organizations due to covid uh, shift so having said that in con conclusion may i say that we all want to be practical uh, we would like to go back and see the philosophy see the so um, it's 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 high time for us to actually go and uh, look at what karl popper has said in 1950s what the thomas kuhn has said about the meaning of paradigm in 60s uh, what the uh, the uh, playerberg uh, has uh, uh, said that the paul uh, playerberg has said about uh, the challenging of the scientific methods so those philosophical insights are now coming in big time now and get clarity on concepts and applications of conduct and in terms of the content can be contextualized so in that light in my conclusion may i say uh, from a entrepreneurship development point of view there are there are multiple opening coming up in terms of the sme sector development multiple opening coming up uh, in terms of the people practices it's high time for us to get our story right get our uh, the concrete story right for them otherwise uh, we as management um, professionals become just preachers but not having a proper established concrete uh, results and output and outcomes so with that may i say thank you very much uh, we'll take it forward uh, as we progress with the discussion thank you uh, mr chairman and thank you once again dr <laughs> thank you uh dr sivanta i love your last uh, slide there if you held the turtle you only make progress when you stick to his neck out wonderful um dr sivanta yeah thank you very much i think you brought some um Yeah, some great points uh, forward, and you know what I've personally taken out of your presentation, and which I value greatly, is what you've done is taken the reality of our current situation and placed that into a very sound conceptual theoretical framework. That if we grasp it, we can actually use that framework. You know, to navigate successfully out of where we are into the future. You know, the other thing that I, I personally really appreciated um, about your presentation 
uh, was also my take uh, was you know, that that critical importance of a future perspective, uh, you know, which was enormous, enormously valuable. Uh, I loved your VUCA too. Um, it's the first time I've seen that. And, um, you know, I think that just provides so much, um, I guess, inspiring um, thought for us. Yeah, because we're all used to the, you know, the, the, the cliched old VUCA, and yeah, we know about it. But the VUCA too, I think, provides a lot of inspiration um, for the future. So the final point that um, you know, I loved was that, you know, are we ready to practice? Are we ready to actually grasp all the stuff that we've got going around us and take some sort of action, you know, to do something concrete, um, you know, to bring about the change that we desire? So thank you so much. I really appreciated um, your session. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do now is to um, open up the session. We've still got a little bit of time to deal with any questions and answers. Uh, we've had one, um, we we've have, had a couple of- Yes, couple of questions, sir. Yeah, so- Would you uh, like to- No, I, I want, yeah. Okay. Okay. If you'd like to, if you'd like to read this question out. Yes, I'll do that, sir. So one of the questions is that post COVID, when the world has now started to rely upon AI, and the future is probably AI as well, how can we expect empathy and human understanding in the corporate world? So how will we keep maintaining a work life balance? Okay, what I would appreciate doing um, if I can just very briefly put this to the panel members, I have some views on that as well. And then, uh, you know, just open it up further. So Dr. Spinder, would you like to have the first go at answering that? Which was, sorry, you just clarify, I was typing. <laughs> Which question was it? The COVID one, post COVID one? On the no, chat. no, the, the AI one. Okay. Um, Okay, so so will it lower the work burden? Let's no, see. no, no. Um, Sanjila, Sanjila can repeat the question. Uh, Sanjila, yes, what's the question again? I can do that. Uh, the question is that post COVID, when the world has now started to rely upon AI, and the future is probably uh, also AI, how can we expect empathy and human understanding in the corporate world? And uh, how can we maintain uh, a work-life balance with technology? Oh, that's a fantastic question. It really is. And I, I think that is going to be the next challenge. And I think, um, you know, the first speaker that did mention sort of mental health issues and other issues that are coming along in the world where, you know, people are on their own too much and they are struggling. And COVID has certainly brought out the worst in, in that. Um, I think there are lots of benefits with technology and I think, you know, in terms of efficiency, in terms of safety, in terms of lowering risk. So there, there, are, there are a lot of benefits. But I think as human beings, we have to still find a way of, um, you know, when it's safe to, to communicate regularly with each other and to really show that respect for humanity and that, that kindness. I think that's going to be even more important as we go forward. And not not deny our feelings, and not deny how we you know how we feel our emotions at all. So there's got to be more forums for that. Thank you, Dr. Spinder, Dr. Samantha, and then Ignace, and then I'll have a go as well, and I'll throw it open. Thank you. I think wonderful questions to start. Uh, I have two facets for that. The first part is if you look at the science and technology, the science means it's all about knowledge. The technology is a skill. So if you look at the, the scholarly work, the, where the field we belong to, the scholarly work has been appreciated. The Nobel Prizes are being given on that, and the Nobel laureates are being created. But if you look at the technology, it's a skill and it's evolving. So if you look at uh, even engineering and medicine, while having uh, so much of developments in, in technology, but still we are now, uh, I would say, relatively struggling at big time uh, in, in the global scale. So that is the knowledge and skill aspect of this, this domain of artificial intelligence. My second uh, facet in brief, uh, it's about 
earlier we discussed before even covid high tech high touch it's about head and heart so you are with high tech uh, the technology you are empowered connected and at the same time there is a touch the touching the emotional part if the emotional part is missing so there is no growth so i would use a term called instead of a work life balance it's about work life harmony it's about um, integration it's about integration between uh, the work and life so we can't separate it it's, it's a matter of finding the best synergy harmony within that then artificial would intelligent would be a one facet and there are many more to come so the point is that let's find our synergy let's find our harmony let's find our integration through that we can navigate it thank you thank you ignace would you like to add anything to that it's not an easy question um but i would say we have stopped questioning we have stopped questioning what we see what we read what we hear we need to apply a critical mind we need to apply a critical mind because not everything we hear or see is correct now let's give one example of a self driving car for instance if we don't have the human touch we are gone the self driving car is on the road and suddenly there is one group of 10 people coming and on the other side there is a bus with one person technology cannot decide what to hit because i have no choice it's either 10 people or the bus technology cannot make these critical decisions human beings will always be required to make critical decisions we still have emotions we have to also apply these emotions machines can never replace human thinking but to be useful and needful as human beings we need to ask questions we need to be critical human beings that's very important never give up the capacity to ask questions and that is happening now look at the media whatever we read about covid we think it's correct but everything is correct because so many things are not known yet so to be relevant in the next 100 years we need to develop and use a critical mind that's my input thanks ignace uh, what i would like to add to that if you look at um uh, yeah all the ai developments that are happening and if you also look at the demand globally for what we in india love to call soft skills um your yeah, empathy humanity and all of those good things and the incredible demand in the ai world to get a balance of incorporating as uh, i think dr smart said i i did a seminar on this a while back so having high tech but built into that high tech have the high touch if you have the high tech without the high touch it's never going to work and an ai is not going to deliver you know all the the wonderful things we we believe it is going to deliver unless there is that integration with high touch uh yeah i think that's uh that's my take i don't think we have to be that concerned about it um i see we have some other international perspectives here um Maria would you like to um have a go at answering that or not Thank you very much and best regards from Finland First of all I would like to say warmest thanks for the designers who have made the program because it is really interesting to look at Uh, challenges and many things from different points of view but what i am thinking now it is uh, especially what uh, uh, dr hendrix uh, told about the leaders 
So we, my mind is that we need to uh, uh, totally change the content of uh, uh, edu uh, education in uh, at universities. Uh, how can we uh, educate leaders for the future? Who can lead the people who are part-time part working at home and they are part-time working in the office and you need to get uh, products and results and uh, also they need to uh, work so that businesses are going on. So that is very rapid uh, need for higher education uh, area in the near future for me. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And, uh, you know, I guess the final remark from, from uh, me on that, yeah, if you look at what are the most critical skills for the future, um, I think the soft skills are going to put up a hell of a battle uh, to stay in line with the, you know, the, with the tech skills. I think it's going to be a great balance. Would anyone else, uh, would one other person from the audience like to have a go at answering that question? Uh, the screen is open. Okay, I don't see any further responses. Um, can I, uh, sorry, can I ask the other question which was there or not? Yes, our... please do, please do. Okay. I was going to ask you to do that. Yeah, so uh, the other question which has been asked is that, uh, as Sir Inya said, we need to hold informal meetings, but how to bridge the gap for social needs of comforting and being able to confide in fellow employees regarding work-life stress as earlier, a dinner or a drink with a colleague would have been an escape now, but it isn't the same. Yeah, there's a problem there on, on the social front and the emotional. Who would, like, who would like to have a go to answering that one? I think in many ways, I think, you know, looking at me and my colleagues, I mean, you know, when we did used to, we did used to meet for dinner and drinks and lunches and, and I miss that sorely. I really, really miss that experience. But I think we've still got the mindset here in the UK that this is going to be a temporary situation and that suddenly things are going to go back to normal, but actually it will never go back to normal. It will be a new normal. And I think people are still finding a way around that. We've had um, Zoom meetings where we've had individual meals and drinks, so everybody's sitting in their own homes, and that saves a lot on taxi fares and um, you know commutes. But it, you, you don't have the same social interaction, and looking at a screen all the time is it, it, it's, it's very very difficult. I think for for me, the survival strategy is just phone calls and talking to human beings, you know, properly on a phone. But I don't have a long-term solution. And maybe you know, using you know, using the ready the virtual technology we've got to try and replace that as much as we can, knowing it's not going to be an easy take. Would no. anyone else like to comment on that? Uh, yeah. Dr. Samantha, um, I saw you yes. uh, looking interested there, mate. Go for it. Uh, right. So here, certain things, of course, um, in in social engagement uh, frontier, the domain, we will be missing. That we can't uh, like have a trade off there. Uh, things like engagement, things like um, this networking, say hi to our colleagues, that companionship, you would miss that. That's why in education, uh, also we used to use this uh, word, say that through virtual, you may deliver the content. Sometimes you may miss the life. So that certain life factors, uh, you, you can't have a trade-off or like a strike a balance. Having said that, for meetings, I think a couple of... Um, a certain to-do list uh, in terms of the mindset. Uh, for an example, since the question asked about the stress factors, and now the, the organizers, so the company point of view, the administrator's point of view, when you're setting meetings, it does not mean that all 24 hours, the entire 24 hours, uh, the entire time slot is available for meetings. And it is not. At the same time, the, the, the time you set uh, th that indicates the administrators thinking about the employees' concern. Uh, earlier, it was mentioned about the empathy factor. And in terms of the conducting of meetings, actually, have we revisited the, what is the meaning of purpose of meeting? Uh, so then the virtual setup has given some plus points. We are ready all factors. Be ready. And this is the time slot, uh, the quick, 
quick uh, argument counterpoints, the matter done. So if we go to that tiny details, we can see that some of the conducting of meeting, the skill set transfer, uh, so much of preparation required in this context. So those are some of the aspects. It's a matter of uh, our approach, our mindset, uh, the way we handle uh, in, in this new new demands per se. Thank you. Dr. Toronto, I think one thing I'd like to just add to that on the meetings, um, I'm personally involved in a hell of a lot, uh, the same as all of us, you know, in a hell of a lot of meetings and the rest of it. And you know, just one small thing that I find you know, really powerful that before we start a meeting is just to go around the table. I mean, obviously, if you've got a lot of people, it's not practical, but you know, if it's half a dozen people or so, it's just to go around the, the table and say, yeah, would you like to share one good one thing that you're grateful for right now? And wow, yeah, it's it's it just changes everyone's thinking. It gets them into a positive um, mindset. Or, you know, would you like to just share one thing that's on your mind? Um, and yeah, that just so shows some humanity, you know, some sort of connect, emotional connect that it's not all just formal business, business, business. Ignace, I can see you looking as though you want to say something there, mate. Well, um, to connect, I want to compare our personal situation. We used to connect in the office. Now, on a personal level, before COVID, we used to meet friends, two, three, four friends. We had a few snacks, we had a few drinks. What have we done? in the first month of COVID, because we were missing it, sorry, we were missing that social contact, is that, okay, um, we have the same setting, we prepare a few snacks, we prepare a few drinks, you do it at your home, you do it at your home, and we connect on Zoom, and we have the same talk, informal talk, instead of sitting in the same room, we have two, three, two, three different rooms, but we have the same setting, with a glass of wine, a few snacks, informal talk, we created that at our homes, and we connect through, uh, Zoom. We can do that with colleagues also, just to co to connect because we don't need to talk every time about um, about business. We need to spend some time to talk about whatever we want to talk. So create these informal moments. Thank you. Yeah, I see there is another question, Ron. Um, somebody is uh, asking that uh, we uh, put in a lot of effort in our education system uh, in entrepreneurship. But today here in India, we don't see so many entrepreneurs. How does that come? That's the recap of the question. So um, if I, um, why do we not have so many entrepreneurs? Of course, we have a lot of entrepreneurs if you compare to my country, Belgium. But of course, if we compare to America, for instance, we don't have so many entrepreneurs. And why is this? I think it starts with our education system in India. Failing is not accepted. We don't look at people who have failed at this, in the same way like others. Failing is like, you're ashamed in India about failing. Not in America, maybe not in UK also. Failing is learning, is getting up and moving ahead. In India, I notice you have 99%, if you have 95, I'm a failure. We need to change that environment. We need to accept that Failing is part of learning. And without learning, we won't have entrepreneurs. We won't have people who take the risk and who know failing is learning. Unless we change that concept in India, we won't do that well compared to America. So thanks, Ignis. One thing I would like to add to this, and um, a lot of the, the Indian business schools uh, don't like me at all. I think a lot of the business schools, a lot of the universities have a hell of a lot to answer for because our Indian education system, a lot of the Indian uh, business schools are incredibly good at creating job seekers, not job creators. You know, I've, I've uh, been guest uh, speaker, faculty or whatever you know, at many business schools and yeah, in many, in many different countries. And when I'm speaking to a group of, um, of MBAs, MBA students, the question I ask, and I also do a lot of um, 
a student vocational guidance. And the question I ask all these people is, what is your future aspiration? And especially the business school people will say, to get a good job, I want to go and work at, at Tata, or I want to go and work at Genpact, or I want to go and work at there. I want to get a good job, and I want to get a salary. So seldom do you hear, you know what I really want to do? I want to take this great idea that I've got, and I want to, I want to become an entrepreneur. If you look at the syllabi of so many of the business schools, and I know it's changing, thank God, and kudos to all the business schools that are changing it. But I've looked at so many business schools in India, when I've looked at their syllabi for MBAs, for, for BCOMs and the rest of it, quite often you are fortunate if you see a tiny little bit of the, the curriculum is around entrepreneurship. Um, so I believe, well, let me share a quick story with you. Um, I was um, developing what they refer to as a high pot, high potential program. And for professional reasons, the name of the, um, the client will, will remain confidential. I was developing this high potential program for new MBA graduates. And this was also published, I think, uh, in the Economic Times um, in India. And what the company said, and this for me was horrific. They said, 80% of the MBAs that are coming to us are unemployable. They don't understand business. They don't have the leadership skills, the analytical skills, the thinking skills, the the entrepreneurial skills to add value to the business. So Dr. Satish, you're probably going to be very angry with me. <laughs> but you know, I think things are changing. But I think for me, that is the reality of the world as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Ron, just to, uh, you know, keep all the international speakers, you know, uh, informed and yourself, as far as Jim's is concerned for our PGDM, you know, we have five specializations. So students can specialize in, uh, we have a dual specialization. So apart from the vanilla envelope of marketing, finance, and HR, we have entrepreneurship and we have business analytics. So- uh, Congratulations. Can, yeah, so there's a lot of focus on entrepreneurship. We encourage them. Uh, we have established an incubator in the campus as well with one of the Delhi University colleges in partnership with them. So there's a lot of encouragement to students. In fact, if they want to go in for an alternative to campus placement. So as far as gyms is concerned, the students I think uh, are uh, encouraged and entrepreneurship is a focus area. I can see uh, Spinder is smiling. So that's I'm her area. I, I, yeah, it is my area. I, it was a beautiful question, a very sensible question. And you know, some students, they work for a company for a few years, then they think of coming, yeah. you know, starting a business or they go into a family business. But in the UK, a lot of the Indian immigrants, they started their businesses because they faced a lot of prejudice in the workplace. So they were working for companies, they were working. And because of that prejudice, it, it, they were pushed into entrepreneurship almost. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's lots of factors that, that sort of um, make you grasp it. But yeah. um, the question is about lacking courage and support. And I think, uh, you know, that Sirab Singh posed that question and it's a very good one. Yeah. I think yeah. um, even the students that I interviewed, once they were running their own businesses, they saw their friends working for companies, earning a good salary, while they themselves hadn't really, in their first two, three, years of the business made any money so there is an opportunity cost there is a sacrifice it depends how much self-belief you have as well it takes yeah. courage thank you spinder so uh, ron i think uh, we've uh, run out of time uh, and uh, yeah. yeah before i hand over to sanjeeva for the next session i want to thank you very much for being here and all of you uh, samantha inya spinder uh, you know, for being here for gyms, supporting us in our, you know, key, this is our flagship event, the international conference. Every year we have it, you've been there before. So this is all virtual now and thank you very much for your support. And it was excellently conducted, very rich in content, a lot of rich perspectives. And I'm happy to welcome Samantha for the first time and I hope uh, there'll be more association. 
in the future uh, conferences. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you, you. Satish, thank you from our side. Thank you very thank you much. And to everyone, namaste. 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 Uh, so if um, COVID gets over, good luck, God bless, and uh, we hope we'll see yeah. you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Inyas, thank you very much. Inyas. Yeah. You're welcome. It was always a pleasure to share some uh, opinions with, with students. And yeah. uh, I appreciate the fact that you are doing this session for, I think I'm attending for for more than 10 years. So Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Yes, Sanjila, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. So thank you all once again for such a captivating and stimulating discussion on the subject. And the key takeaway that I take from all the eminent speakers is that in order to deal with the post-pandemic situation, uh, I can only use three words, which I feel would be uh, summarizing the session would be, uh, recovering, responding, and thriving with the situation that we are faced. So engaging uh, in, a, in a productive manner, that would be the answer to how we deal with the situation that we are faced today. So thank you all once again. And uh, I would now like to hand over to my co-host, uh, Ms. Jyoti Kukreja, for further technical sessions. So good day to all of you, and thanks for today.